being sat down, perhaps I <coughs> may be allowed as, as chairman uh, of the evening to perhaps sod off and to say a few words about this event. Now, if I could just uh, introduce what we thought that it would be about. Um, we originated the idea of this event um, last summer. And in fact, uh, Paul Finch and uh, Frank Duffy uh, got together with me and we decided that it would be good to have some discussions and some exchanges on some of the key questions and issues that we're facing in architecture today. And they're discussions which we hope would engage as wide an audience uh, as is possible and which would use the AA in one of the ways in which it traditionally has been used. That is, as uh, a meeting and discussion center uh, for architecture. So tonight's forum, which is the second uh, in this series, will be examining the theme of structural expression in architecture. And so for this evening, uh, we've tried to assemble through invitation, through coercion, uh, through uh, fair means and through foul, uh, as many architects, engineers, teachers and students, and of course all interested people who've got things to say about those sorts of architecture that have come about through different formulations of the idea of expression of structure. Formulations which might, by some readings, be seen as being governed by, for example, technological rules alone, that is to say, <coughs> by some sort of internal logic, while in other readings it might be seen as being governed by ethical rules. And we might remember Ruskin's Lamp of Truth, which was so important for the modern movement and through which it becomes nothing less than an immoral act to use materials in an extravagant or in an arbitrary way. <coughs> and of course, <coughs> we might notice that this ethic is often found also accompanying this same logic. But another uh, and currently common reading tells us that the expression of structure can be, and often is, conceived of as an aesthetic, sometimes quite openly defying at least the ethic, but also sometimes defying the logic, while being the <coughs> result of a private, uh, subjective, <coughs> aesthetic criteria alone. <coughs> anyway, this sort of description doesn't exhaust uh, these sort of possibilities. I'm just trying to sort of indicate some possible ways that we might open up this discussion. So I'll try to not say very much, but just sort of add that expression of structure uh, as we are posing it uh, tonight, I hope is not just a pragmatic problem. You don't just have to do it, as it were, uh, in an uninformed way. 
When we pose the idea of structure expression, I think we're engaging with or taking part in one of the major discourses in architecture. One which has been evolving through such disciplines as engineering, architecture, or as we heard last week uh, from Robert Thorne in one of the lead-up lectures which we, had, which we had to this evening, through structural engineering manufacturers and fabricators, and he was talking about early 19th century fabricators, but I think the same is, is true uh, in different degrees to today, all helping together to make technological discourse. Architects then are only a part of it, and I think that one of the opportunities this evening is to <coughs> see what part the architects play in this enterprise. So I, I would like to feel that tonight we're we're going to ex assume that we're holding these discussions then about structural expression in architecture within a framework about which we might ask you to consider whether this enterprise in some form or other appears to be alive and well or whether you believe that it has new directions to go, or maybe everything is just fine as it is. So <clears throat> let me just then stop at this point and just say that uh, the model for our meeting uh, this evening uh, is to ask uh, several people who we have invited to speak uh, to talk for a few moments, uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, to show some slides, and then to open the discussion to you all. So the intention then is to try to make it, if possible, uh, as good an exchange as we, as we humanly can, and we'll do everything we can to gain access to everybody, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. Now, um, I think that maybe, <coughs> I wonder if I could start by uh, asking, <laughs> what about asking, asking one, of the, one, of our, uh, one of the people who've been helping to work this project out, although he doesn't know he's going to be asked, although I think he's got a hint, uh, that Frank Newby, what about saying a few words and um, maybe... <coughs> Uh, what? Oh, have you got a have you got a slide loading program? <coughs> We're in a common camp. I have, um, Can you? Do, are we going to be determined by the way you loaded the slides? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well. Okay, so about the slides that come on. <laughs> he doesn't we mind which slides, slides they are. Said that was going to happen. Okay. Okay, right, fine. There are only six. <coughs> the reason I've been asked to start is that I'm the oldest. <laughs> or not. <laughs> oh, that's true, sorry. <laughs> oh, you've retired. <laughs> Dead. I um, wanted to um, illustrate... Um, that's me, back to front, it's all right. Still standing. I know that. Is there one before that, Frank? No, that's fine. That's, um, Back in the in the fifties, um, in fact, in forty nine, I, I joined Samueli, and uh, after the war, materials were very short supply, and there was a movement towards um, folded plates, space construction, um, 
which now is known as monocoque or semi-monocoque, whatever that means. Um, I, just, I was showing, in fact, a, um, a slide of the sort of lattice steel shells that Samueli was producing at, at that period. They were pure structure, <coughs> economic, um, and the architects tended to accept one of a number of schemes that we might propose to them. We'll go on to the next one. <coughs> No, it's the wrong way. <laughs> hey, that's, yes, that's fine. That's, um, that's better. That's to work with Theo Crosby on the UIA pavilion, which is um, folding 12 gauge sheets of aluminium and into tetrahedra and connecting them together with compression tubes at the top, again showing um, how folding material you can produce stiffness and so you can produce <coughs> a structure. And this is one of, as it were, many possibilities. Once you go into three dimensions, um, you've got so many kind of ways of doing it, it really comes from a discussion with the architects of, for an exhibition, what would you like to do, which you've never done before, and this, <laughs> and this, this, this turned up. Next, you wouldn't call it structural expression. This is um, so. Here we have, in fact, a few years later, with Cedric Price, the birdcage of the zoo, where I, I was wanting a structure which was appeared to be floating in midair, and influenced by Bucky Fuller and Ten Secretary. Um, there are quite a number of possible <coughs> solutions. Um, we made a model which worked. Then when we started calculation, once we got the job, found that one of the cables to the ground was in compression. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that when we made the model, we pre-tensioned the cables for the structure. So in fact, I, I pre-tensioned a member in it so that it could take compression, so that visually, there's a member of a cable which is actually taking compression. A reduction in tension is compression. Um, therefore, engineers, when you have particular types of structures or redundant structures, one member too many, <coughs> at least one, then you can pre-tension, pre-stress the structure and put in it man-made stresses, which uh, you, in fact, add to stresses due to normal leading so that we are, it's possible to produce structures, and this is just one example, which don't look as though they should stand up, but they do. The next slide, please. This is a doodle which um, illustrates the fact that the bottom one is a, so a pure structure where the loads in members, if they're compression, they're tubes, and if they're in tension, they're cables. But there was an architectural decision, and Cedric's not here, this is Heidi, um, to in have tetrahedra at the top um, suspended in midair, as against having at the bottom um, three members in compression in tubes and other tension members as though you had a complete tension net around the structure through which you looked at the bird. <coughs> if you, you then can have tension members either <coughs> in, uh, in tubes which could take compression or tension, therefore it's up to, in a way, the architect to decide what sort of expression of the structure you're going to have. Pete Cook at, um, at Bath the other week said he couldn't care less. In fact, if it was an exciting structure, he didn't mind whether it worked or not, and didn't really mm -hmm. matter what, what went, layers went here or there. So there's a, we as engineers can, uh, one, <coughs> manipulate the layers in members in certain cases. Also, you have the opportunity to, to change the, the kind of visual form of a structure um, in that particular case. 
Again, I don't think it's structural expression as we are trying to define this evening. The next one. And we have the IBM at Thursday uh, with, with uh, Grimshaw, which was an exposed structure, slightly overbraced from a structural point of view, but um, um, <coughs> this, I don't know whether you call it high tech or not, but the uh, structure is being slightly used as decoration. Um, <coughs> Not to a great extent, you have in fact portal frames of latticed space frame structures spanning on the outside because neck on the inside wants a clean, smooth finish, and there's a single skin metal deck construction between the, the structure. The structure was becoming exposed, and I'm not quite certain whether um, in structural expression is exposed structure. I think not. I think it started this way. I think it's, uh, it's slightly more than, uh, more than just exposing the structure. And the next, and last, is a leisure centre at Doncaster where the, the architect has emphasised the structure. Uh, and if you can see it clearly, but um, you've got kind of capitals made out of RSJs with holes in. and. Um, Really, I didn't have a great deal to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> but it does raise a question whether you have to distort or overexpress structure, overdo structure, in order to express it. And I'm interested to kind of remark to see as to how you create excitement. Do you, do you in fact do a, you distort the structure, do you add in kind of tension nets and so forth. What, what is the, the, the architect's idea of, of structure, of expressing structure? Because I don't think it's pure structure. I think it's almost anti-structure or impure structure where you start getting excitement. Thank you. Right, thank you. Can we have the lights on? <coughs> um, Right, well, uh, I, I wondered if, um, uh, if uh, we could also, I do, ha I do know that, uh, uh, that James Sutherland is particularly interested in this particular period of time, and, uh, or his, the, early, uh, the early period of the, the 50s, and the, the uh, arch architecture and engineering, which was the product of the 50s, and I think... Uh, you, you also might be able to feed in something about this. Okay. Could you um, do Yes. That? Can you hear? Actually, Mark, have you got my little bundle? I didn't know. Well, they're not quite ready yet, but... Uh, um, well, anyway, let me start. Um, I want to look back on the, the, the 50s and 60s when we didn't actually... We, we really were looking at pure structure, I think, most of us. Um, we, were, um, we were expressing the structure as such, and I'm really trying to ask questions about this. Um, we didn't do it consciously as a style. We, we did it partly because of material shortages. We did it, I think, because of a religion of functionalism, which many of us believed in. It really was a very strong religion. And to some extent, it was <laughs> aesthetic. But again, I'm not certain you know, how it looks today. Um, now, what I really want to know is, I want to show about four or five slides and see, I'm very interested to know what people think of these today. And I'm particularly interested in people under 40. I mean, no one of my age, I mean, I don't, you know, we're all so tainted with it that, that you know, it, it doesn't matter. Could we start, Mark? Um, so there's a very old crummy slides, the first two. Um, they sort of... <coughs> Yes, um, this is the sort of the, the post-war school period when we were actually cutting things down and down and down and down. Um, we, we, we used almost no steel and we pre-stressed pre everything. 
We had crazy structures sitting on 150 square columns, and then we chipped away a lot of them with three stories on top. Um, and we, we really, actually, I think we're rather proud of what we were doing. But I think today they look rather mean. Let's go to the next one. And they, they were sort of awful little sort of tin, sort of tinny looking shed buildings, I think now. But I'd like to ask a question about this in the end. Next, please. And I remember looking at that thing and saying, my God, those things look terribly heavy, don't they? Couldn't we get those columns a lot slimmer? But now I look at it again, and I think it, they looked rather, they, they looked rather spindly. Um, and um, next is, I mean, sometimes we actually produced a bit of drama, um, but I think it was spoilt by sort of the, the, the sort of rather miserable materials we were working in. Next phase. And there, you know, it was all sort of wood wall and, you know, and it was, it was terribly honest and straightforward, but I think it looks a little mean. Now, next phase. We then look back a hundred years and we get something which I find incredibly beautiful. Um, and this is a minimal structure. It's a minimal structure, um, next please, um, of enormous slenderness. Um, and if you just look at those columns, they're, they are, they're, they're incredibly elegant. Um, the whole thing is elegant. Now, what my real question is, that I think is a sort of cult structure by today's standards. Now, will the 1950s, 60s, structures which I showed become cult structures in 25 years or have they started to now or will they never? I really actually want, I must, I'm not offering any opinion on this, I just want to actually to see if others, particularly younger people, would give me an idea on this subject because I'm, I'm a bit worried about our pure functionalism now but I would very much like to hear what other people think. It might suddenly become a cult. Can I just interject? Is that the one in Regent's Park? No, it's the one in Kensington Gardens. Oh, sorry. <coughs> no comment. <coughs> no, Je Je James Sutherland has invited anyone under 40. Well, I, I prefer... <laughs> <coughs> no, not necessarily under 40. Anybody, oh. honestly. But I, it's particularly oh. like to see what, you know... Because there's more chance of finding out what people will think in... 25 years' time if we got the 20-year-olds now than, than if we get the 50-year-olds now. It's just that they put one up in Reed's book a few years ago, exactly the same, so brand new. Mm. I just thought, I thought it was interesting. Mm. I mean, that is a cast-iron column. I mean, um, there, there, there's no bracing in it at all. It's incredible structure. Um, you mean it's unstable? <laughs> no! <laughs> no! That's the whole point. It is not unstable. It, it stood the gales in, in October, it is, it is, um, it is seven, and, and it withstood the recent ones. But I doubt whether you could actually get it through, through any modern building control officer now. <laughs> a question from my neighbour, 60. Can you speak a bit louder, Gordon? <laughs> a question from my neighbour, 60. Well, <laughs> are the columns waterproof? Which of those ones? Yeah. Are they wanted? Are they water filled? Water filled? Water filled. Uh, not deliberately. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they aren't drain pipes. Um, uh, um, but they're, they're, they're certainly not. They're certainly not water filled for fire resistance. No. 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 Proper resistance. I mean, uh, they may be. Um, that is uh, simply an interesting question. Mm. No, no, well, no, I think they. I think if they got water filled, they, they would crack in the frost. Um, but, but that's what. Um, mm. If you had this in glycol in them, they would not. Oil. Oh, oil them. No, well, I don't know if they need anything in them. I don't know what quite what. Um, they're, they're, they're very happy the way they are. Um, <laughs> Mm. Uh, simply 
in engineering. Sir. Well, yes, except that they have actually a little bit of, at the bottom and the top, of a little bit of bulge, a little bit of ball, and yeah. they somehow, I and mean, that they look to me incredibly elegant. The things we were doing with straight tubes in the fifties yeah. don't look so elegant. Now I don't actually quite see. I mean, maybe that they're just too recent. The, the yeah, James, have you actually? produced any calculations to show that uh, they wouldn't stand up under modern methods, even with ultimate lead? Mm -hmm. These? Yes. No, I haven't. I freely admit. Uh, but, um, um, what a pity. <laughs> 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 right. Perhaps um, because um, it's actually important in the pavilion of the sky, perhaps what's important is the roof floating in the park, and the columns actually have no significance at all, except that they need to be there to hold it up. Mm. Down. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But it's the sway on that which I would be worried about. But I think you know, whether it structurally it works or not isn't very significant. What does, I think, is interesting is whether they, um, the, the 50s, 60s ones are just too recent for us to see straight, or whether, you know, they're, 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 they're all right, or whether they, um, they're just rather mean and nasty. I don't know. I'm not interested. Isn't there something rather fabulous about the 40s and 50s where we were under such pressure to use no material at all? Mm. And this, this kind of pressure on you and us, engineers and architects, was so extreme that some of the most fabulous forms actually were generated. And things like all those sort of shell barrels, all those funny wooden punt systems, or all, 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 all those absolute minimalist sort of zigzag um, beams and things. Um, and it, it was actually very exciting to work um, in, 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 in a kind of pressure which mm. forbade <coughs> yes. excess. I look, totally agree with you, and I find it very exciting, and you find it exciting. I do, yes. but, but but what I want to know is, was the results worth it? <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> right, one answer. Um, because um, one achieved um, 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 an enclosure with the minimal, yes. uh, 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 maximum of effort, but a minimal uh, uh, m m minimalization of material. Mm. And isn't that what architecture and engineering is all about? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Ron, I think the... <laughs> um, as someone that was a student in the 50s and not practicing until late, if, if running parallel exactly with that was another sort of architecture which was to do about heaviness and it was to do with making things bigger ne if necessary, there was a sort of expressionism in them, but it was an exaggeration and you were mixed up in this later. Yes, you were. <laughs> Late, later, this became known as the new brutalism. And I just reminded of that, the new brutalism, an ethic or an aesthetic. Eh? To quote the Smithson. But it, I think it's interesting that, that often in history, we pull out the thing that, uh, that uh, we remember best. But in history, all those things go on at the same time. So I don't think it, it's very important that the, the audience under 40 or under 30 realize that, that the 50s weren't necessarily totally about fining down, making thin. And uh, even, even, I mean, the, the things that Sam's were doing in the 50s were uh, not necessarily matched by other engineers. I think it was the late 50s, in fact, after the festival, which was a, a thin period. Uh, <laughs> then in fact, in the 50s, then you started a reaction to that, was in fact the, the heavy. No, but, the, uh, but always, frankly, parallel to it, there is this, there's always something, I mean, at the moment, you could say that things are about lightness or transparency, but not everything's about that. Huh? At least, that, I mean, everything happens, I mean, everything's going on at the same time. So I think you're pulling out something to, to explain 
But your thesis, I don't disagree. I would never dream of disagreeing with Frank. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? 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 No, well, we are talking about the structure of expression. Oh, I know. Trying to define what it means. What, yeah. And in fact, you pull out things to illustrate that particular idea. <laughs> Yes, everything was going on at the time. You know, I, I'm afraid, as, as a, a well over 40, <laughs> whose views are perhaps invalid about those schools, um, uh, yes, I think they are mean and dismal, because they, um, people try to excise expression from them. They're actually slightly, when they say so, subhuman. They deliberately try to uh, expunge this element, and I feel that that is what their meanness is about. But you see, I, I was brought up on this so-called thinness, and it was as a result of going time and time again to the Festival of Britain, mainly because of the structures which I found fascinating, much more than anything else. I tried. Um, I mean, there were some absolutely superb ones. I was quite young then. As a result of that exhibition, I'm going to show my age now, I actually applied for a job with uh, Samueli and got one. And it was at the, this time of thinness and lightweight taut structures, some of which looking back on them weren't necessarily very appropriate for their purpose, but some of them were very exciting and from an engineer's point of view then, and to a certain extent now but in perhaps a different way, they were wonderful things to work on because they were a terrific challenge. And I can remember one particular instance of a, of a three-story, very lightweight, steel frame building, it was a school actually, if I remember right, which had precast concrete floors, which are specially designed, one of Sammy's favourites. And that was the most wobbly structure you could possibly imagine until you got the last bit in, as it were, and then it all locked up beautifully. Now, that's not perhaps, I mean, not necessarily anything to do with architecture, although it is, because it was a piece of architecture. Can't remember who the architect was. It's gone on the east of the It was county architect. The that's columns that's were right. 100 what? millimeters square, going up three or four stories. That's right. This was actually because the engineer who designed that building went sick, and I arrived in the office that week. I had to take it over for a short while, and that was a sort of flooding for me. And it made a very great impression. You probably realise because I'm talking about it so much. <laughs> and I went, I went on and oh, and I worked for Sammy and Paul for seven years. And then I went on to do things on my own, as it were, and have, I'm interested, actually. Deep link. <laughs> been deep link. <laughs> oh, I don't know, actually. Maybe I haven't. I think some people think I haven't been deep link. Um, I'm, of course, interested in pure structure. I, 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 can I come back to the it's not part of the conversation. Right. Right. I think you're all going to have to talk a little bit louder, because people at the back, I don't think you're picking up much of the conversation. Oh. Can I, can I just, 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 just re reply to, to these rather, rather ha 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 Heron's comments about the, the, the juxtaposition of the whole brutalism um, after the period which I was actually referring to, which was the post-war economy period, which actually happened just before um, um, the Smithsons won the Hans Stanton School competition. The Hans Stanton School competition was a product, really, of that post-war economy situation. Then they themselves reacted to that, <coughs> and uh, not altering their theory, but altering their forms, which actually became heavy. Now, whether this is in any way to do with structural expressionism, I doubt. I think it forces much more than the forces of pure structure that brought this shift in Bruckner's theory of, 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 of very subtle forces um, and, and very dramatic forces. So I, I think um, it's interesting that you buildings which both Ron and I have been involved with are, are a separate issue to my excitement about the minimalist buildings of media post-war. Yeah, no, no, I think the thing that's interesting, that if you take the brutalist building, they were very simple. I mean, the usually the structure was uh, a column and a big beam, and it was concrete, and you 
read it as a material. So somehow you could argue that, that the, the architecture did derive from the engineering, although the engineering was often exaggerated. Thank you. Uh, which is to agree with Frank, as I said. Perhaps it would be useful I, to, to expand or concentrate on the word expression yes. at this stage. It's starting to be used, and if we set up like, and we're only in the 50s. Well, yes, we're going <laughs> to. <laughs> we, we are going to try. Yes, might I come back to an engineering thing, but are they, bo are they, are they both try talking about expressing the same thing? The expression is such a ubiquitous thing. It's what you're trying to express, and whether the architectural or the engineering aspect of it actually is expressing, the, uh, what is the difference between them in terms of what it's trying to express? I, th I think we might actually get a little bit to the present practice, and uh, it would, might be a good idea to get Nick uh, Grimshaw here to to give a few give his little thing so that we can at least begin to get a a picture of uh, of how we might be thinking about some of these same issues. Uh, Ced Cedric Price, sir. Yeah, I just I was coming in while Nick was bringing something up. I didn't know it was going to be all for uh, forty years ago. <laughs> 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 we, we had to. I like Frank Newby on calculated. <laughs> well, he managed to lower the Monadnock theory to three or four floors, 17. Very interesting about weight, minimally. I can sit back here and listen to me, Nick. Nick. <laughs> Up to date. Have you got the slides, please? Have you got the slides, please? Are you all right? Yeah, that's fine. Right, push the chairs together. No, it's three two, on um, no. <laughs> no, two. Two, two, three on two. two. I mean, okay, that was that. Ten in each one going parallel. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
which also support the roof, uh, and which support the roof and support the glazed wall. Again, um, you can see what they're doing. You can see the arms sticking out and holding the glass. And I think that, again, you're getting... Um, almost everyone that goes past that building can actually see what's going on. And I think there's, there's, uh, uh, there's some merit in that, to my mind. Next. This was... Uh, there's, a couple, there's another couple of slides on this. But this was a, a, quite an interesting little problem. Talking of cheapness, we had to do a, a workshop in the Docklands which had to be absolutely dirt cheap. And um, they, we had to cover um, a, a 10,000 square foot workshop um, without any columns in it because they were driving very heavy vehicles inside it. And if they'd run into a column, the thing would have fallen down. And we um, spanned it with these um, 200 diameter tubes um, with, with just very light cross bracing and very simple um, joints. Um, I think, just, if we just have a look at the next one, you can, next pair. Yeah, that's the, that's the effect. But I, I can't say I wasn't <coughs> influenced by pottering around Kachi Sark, which was just on the other side of the. Um, through the Greenwich Tunnel. Um, but it, it, gave, uh, it gave what was an absolutely basic. Talking of those early buildings, I'm, I bet this was probably as cheap as any of those, an absolute basic sheet of Wrigley tin um, with some very minimal amount of structure over it. Um, but it did give it some sort of lift, doing it in steel rather than hidden concrete. Next one. Please. Um, well, again, I think that um, it's fairly easy to see what's going on here. Uh, you've got uh, tie-downs, very heavy tie-downs, on the outside of the building, which bring, which in fact, we, we had to have a retaining, heavy retaining wall all around the side, so those concrete um, lumps stick out of the retaining wall. So we're using the retaining wall as a sort of um, added weight to hold down the perimeter of the building. And then the, there's the sort of rocker arm support the, the central arch. I think it's 42 metres between the columns. And again, we had to have clear span um, because of the um, operations inside. Next one. <coughs> Oh, just, well, and you can see what's going on from the end of the building, too. You can see the arch uh, express there. Uh, it's an arch or a truss? It's a truss, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to the bracing uh, later. If you think about it, if you have a four-bay structure, you can brace two of the bays together to stand up, and you're left with an odd one. You wouldn't like you, you. You say don't put the bracing in the odd one. I say, I say really to hell with it. Put it in. <laughs> um, next pair. Uh, <laughs> and this is a um, again. We got um, this is a forty-five thousand square foot space with no columns in it. Um, and uh, this was our idea for doing it. it, it was, it's, a, it's a retail space, and basically the, the, the thing does two jobs. It, it advertises the home base building, but it also holds up, uh, the, the mast holds up this great spine running through the building. Um, and you can, I, I think you can gr grab what's going on by the, the, um, the, the particularly, I think the next slide, um, you've got the weight of about 14 London, uh, I think it's 30 London buses, Andrew Wally will correct me, you know, you can see it, um, coming down those rods, holding the, um, the spine at, uh, um, just short of the halfway point, supporting that truss. And if Frank would like to put that forward, the supposition that the truss would hold the building up without the mast there, I'd be very, very interested to uh, 
Doesn't help in wind, does it? It would if you put a cone in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 There is a cone. Yeah, yeah, I know there is. And it's capable of taking tension. Tony will perhaps recognise um, this structure. Um, this is our um, station roof for the terminal at Waterloo. And um, this is a, a kind of interesting operation because, um, of course, you would have the people who would say, why don't you do it for Paul and Frey? Um, particularly QSs would say that, probably. Um, and we wanted to do something very elegant, but there was some, some and really like this has made the thing extremely efficient. Um, on the left, we generated it on uh, Tony's computer, YRM, and uh, on the right was our uh, brass model, <coughs> simultaneously. And next one, it shows what's going on better. Um, uh, the interesting thing is, you had uh, the tracks were fixed in position. You couldn't shuffle the tracks around, and you had that outside train, which had a sort of envelope around it of space which you couldn't go within. So we. We were very tight on that side of the site. You had to get the um, structure on the outside of the building there. But where we had space on, uh, on the rest of the roof, we brought the structure inside. So we had a, a, a three-pin structure with the um, members reversing onto the inside. And it, it creates a very elegant um, effect, particularly on the, on the western elevation, which we'll be able to see. Next one. Can okay, you just stop on that? Because that's, I think it's totally interesting that um, you possibly could have had a three-pin frame with a pin central. Um, somehow or other, in fact, going off-center, off the off actual purest shape, you created something, I think, which is, which is very interesting, which is away from the kind of purest form, although you might describe it as the simplest one and purest. But um, I think this is where structural expression comes out, it's not the most economic, the most direct solution. And um, this is, I mean, this is, this is kind of pinpoint, to my mind. But, but I think you'd have to fight quite hard to prove that, that, that to make it symmetrical, it would have been cheaper. I mean, I don't think it's necessary. You see, the point was, you had cheaper. to come up almost vertically on no, the yes. thing about the right-hand side. So if yeah. you then turned over and started to go, if you like, more or less horizontal across the roof, You'd, you'd, um, um, uh, you know, you'd start to have to beef it up. You're using your sight oh. con constraints to your advantage for the kind of expression that perhaps you're looking for. Yes, well, yeah. it's a two-way process, I think is what I'm saying, really. I, and, and, and I'll tell you, sir. We got, we, got something, <laughs> uh, we got something out of it. But you, you didn't have... The other thing, is, which perhaps I didn't say, is on the right, we had no thickness for structure there either. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of... Um, the, the sort of depth you'd need for a, for a massive portalized column. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. I, I think you're, it is actually very elegant. You're, you're quite right to say that the, uh, quite a lot of that structure is generated out of the constraints that we have. And I'm one of the things, Nick, another constraint, in fact, is that, as you said, the tracks are completely fixed in position, and we have this very, very difficult tight boundary <coughs> on the right hand side of the right slide, and the question of having to fit that train in the, on that track. We also have the problem that the, the plan, the fixed plan that we have is curved. It's not only curved, it's tapered as well. It tapers down towards the far end of the station. So that we've been trying at the same time to devise means <coughs> of producing a structure whereby, oh no, there's one other constraint too, of course, and that is the existing arch foundations onto which we've got to found, which has given us certain grid constraints on plan. Um, but. We've been trying to, produce, to, to find a, a, a structural solution which doesn't mean that every time you go from one bay to the next, the whole structure has to change, so it's a different fabrication. And we think that we've devised something which is, um, in <coughs> some sense or other, at that offset joint can be telescopic. That's the right word, way to describe it, I think. And so um, you really need the whole model here, actually, to be able to look Thing, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. And I, I think that, yes, this is a piece of structural expression which I think truly comes out of the 
problems that we have and out of the architecture that Nick wants. And I think it will be seen probably as, as such. Whereas some of the other things we've been talking about, I, I think personally, sorry, I'm not interrupting your talk, Nick. No, you but carry on. Of possibly, I mean, I wanted to talk about, uh, perhaps I'll talk a bit about structural expression myself later on before somebody else fires things at me. But I think some of the, some of the examples we see today of overt structures are perhaps too expressive, too dominant. Um, although, as, I mean, as an engineer, I get very excited, of course, about structure that you can see. But I do think that structure does have to have a certain logic about it. It shouldn't be too <coughs> overblown, although I expect I can be accused of doing that sometimes. And it does, I think, have to have a certain relationship with the architecture. We're not just talking about building structures. We're talking about buildings. Why do you think it's not a portal frame? That? Yeah. It is a portal frame. Oh, well, In engineering terms, it's a three-pin portal. Yeah. Well, yeah. Stated it, just, it wasn't a portal frame. No, I don't... I think that well, was a misconception. It's, it's, it's a complicated issue, because you, you... This does actually need quite a lot of time through, through the base. So does a portal frame? Well, it, it depends on how, how you do it. I mean, you... you <coughs> I think well, it's, a, it's a sort of com it's a complex it's a three pin portal, really. structure. Yes. yes, but Nick, <laughs> Nick, I, I think I'm right in saying that your reference to the portal frame was actually <coughs> disparaging, not on the behalf of this, but that if some elements of British Rail were left to themselves, and certainly the property board, you'd end up with a condor shed portal <laughs> for, type portal frame. Is that right? I couldn't say a word against my client. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could. He's my client. <laughs> well, well, can we continue to the end of your slide? I think that's it. Is this is it? Is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, I wonder if we can. Can we? I mean, if there are any questions or that you want to address. I mean, I think it's quite interesting if we could, even at this stage, sort of raise questions even among ourselves. Well, where are we going with all this? You know, uh, is are things doing anything other than just move along? Are we actually making engineering progress? Are we making architectural progress? Well, what actually is being accomplished uh, in terms of, of, of a progression of an architecture? Is it moving? Can this I, is a question. Can I ask something on that? It seemed to me from the structures that you were talking about, James... Could you stick a little that? Sorry. The structures that James was talking about, the 50s structures, the what had been minimalised was the mechanism of support and that the, the things that were holding up the building had been considered in a sense in isolation from the way the building appeared to the eye. <coughs> no, I don't think it did to the architects of the time. But they, 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 they wanted actually, I think they wanted, or the ones we were working with in those days, wanted actually to express everything. Right. And well, including thinking... the cladding and the, the, the whole thing and the way it looked. Um, it was very, very conscious, but it, there was no, virtually nothing added. Which so they accepted the shape that the, that the structure, in, as a means of support, generated. So it seemed to me that what's different about these buildings we've been looking at is that the, the structure has been considered as a shape in itself, rather than just as a means of support. And therefore somebody's looked at it with an aesthetic eye, as well as a functional eye. Am I being unfair? Frank, are you... has there been a shift in attention? In that way? I think the, the architects today, in fact, are interested in the form of the structure. In the 50s, they were happy to get a job. Uh, if we could minimize the amount of steel used, the job went ahead. We got a permit to build. And the architects were terribly happy to follow through the actual minimum, minimum structure. Now, today, um, we have structures which uh, are economic, but in fact the architects um, are, I wouldn't say, dis well, distorting them slightly for, the, for aesthetic effect. And um, uh, they're using structure as part of decoration and part of the total design. It's exposed, the, the uh, Waterloo has structure going above the roof on one side and not on the other. And um, they're, they're actually well, expressing the structure 
in their own way to achieve what they want as, uh, as architect. It's kind of before in the 50s, um, it, it, I think the architecture appeared with the structure. Uh, now it's, it's different today. But you, you, you seldom have a chance to do a pure structure. It's always influenced by the site constraints or you know, the thermal response of the fabric. And really, the, the opportunity to do a, a pure structure, a pure abstract form, hardly ever occurs. It, it's always bent by influences, by conservation, by the you know the materials that you can use. And it's not the railway station. Mm. Mm. But are, are there rules beyond mm. functional rules? I think these structures I mean, are dull. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, so what, what rules are, would be invoked? I mean, Nick's putting the truss on the outside in one part of the portal frame and on the inside on the other part of the portal frame. I mean, that, that, well, why did you do that, for example? So the train didn't run into it. Well, <laughs> I think that, that, that's not a very good answer. You would have made it a bit higher. <laughs> But it wasn't a functional reason. I mean, are you, are you really arguing it was totally a functional reason? Well, that, I mean, it dro that's what drove us in that direction, basically. But you felt free no, to do that. Used to justify <coughs> yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. there is something, yeah. there is something more complex of, of, of than that, which you've got to acknowledge. The section is a reflection of its bending mm -hmm. diagram. It would have been totally well, the outside of it, too. Would we'll agree, which is why the, the tension rods, which are running underneath, reverse and go on the outside of the structure at that point. Sir Andrew. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Where is it? <laughs> yes, you're quite right. Um, Are it working? No, look, it's wrong. You're getting yeah. really defensive. I mean, in a way, it'd be really nice. No, I'm not defensive about it. I actually think... open up and be, which, I mean, the 50s were wonderful in their self-criticism. <laughs> you know, or self-reflection or self... And I think, in a way, if it could open up so that it wasn't so defensive, much more kind of right, right. Well, we'll, we'll make a demand for a lack of defensiveness. Mika? Well, I, I don't know if they are defensive or if they are implicit in their criteria. Because it seems to me that uh, <clears throat> the first uh, presentation, the Frank presentation, it was, uh, you know, so things went okay in the relationship between the architect and the engineer, especially when the architect and the engineer were Frank. Uh, and said it. Now, when they started to get uh, in, uh, in a slightly different and more contempor contemporary situation, in which uh, the structure might get a little bit uh, decorative, uh, then one sees uh, the twinge, perhaps, uh, of disapproval. And then we have the presentation by James. Uh, and James uses the word elegant. So what are the criteria which you have, uh, which uh, describe or uh, ascribe to, to a structure to be elegant or not elegant? Because you do seem to have some criteria. And those criteria, I think, that they were actually spoken in the last intervention, is this uh, an arch or is this a truss or what the hell is it is about? And then uh, uh, they came out with three definitions, true to material, or, you know, I, I actually did hear the, the echo of Ruskin at some point there. So do the engineers have some sort of criteria, hidden, implicit, or protective, that they use when they have to fight with their architects who want expressions? Can, can I offer one person's... Uh ideas on that. This is a man, David Billington, who studied his book, The Tower on the Bridge, looks at uh, some of the late 19th century bridges and so on. And he offers economy as an overriding concern, and then thinness and integration, which I think was rather close to what you said, Nick. The bridges are very <coughs> different from the buildings. Yes? Economy of what? He's, he's trying to define what he calls yeah. the art of structural engineering. Economy in the use of materials, in his case. Well, I'm actually talking with, with these structural engineers, who are actually have you know, a lot to do with difficult architects uh, mm -hmm. at times. Uh, they no, have not a lot to do with, uh, you know, some architecture which has been, uh, you know, one famous building which is a masterpiece of uh, uh, contemporary architecture which uh, Cambridge University wanted to pull down because technically it was not uh, absolutely so cool. Uh, so, obviously, they have also aesthetic criteria because the word elegant is not just economy of means, it's something more than that. 
I think there are, there are two elegances here, aren't there? there? There's an intellectual elegance which is, goes with the structure to some extent, and there's, there's a purely sort of visual one. And I think probably the best structures are actually where the, everyone who sees it for the first time says, my God, that's beautiful. And the, and the engineer can explain, actually, and you, you know, that, 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 that it actually has an, an intellectual elegance, that he, he, has, he has achieved economy, he has, he has actually shown how the forces go, and th there, is a, there, is, there is a sort of satisfaction there too. I think if you get the two going together, and the, the suspension bridge, the, something like the Seven Bridge, is elegant in that sense. It, it, has, it has both an engineering elegance and a visual one, I think. Fourth, no, the fourth bridge, I think, is, is it, well, do you mean the suspension bridge? The suspension bridge, yes. No, well, that, that has, that's nothing like got the elegance of the, of the Seven or the Humber. Mm. But in, the, in but why? David Billington's book, when he's well, talking about the, um, John Roebling's big bridge, the Washington Bridge, uh, he goes into Roebling's diaries in some detail and shows that even at the very limits of technology, Roebling felt he had a freedom of choice. It wasn't a technically determined solution, and that he was exercising mm. that choice in the direction of this <coughs> elegance, I think, as, as James well, has described. Must the engineers who build bridges and engineers who build buildings, and there's an enormous, you know, enormously more complex software problem of building and building, and working with an architect, and actually going off on your own, and maybe employing an architect to do the handrails. You know, I'm not sure that's true. I think it's I'm an sure immoral suggestion you're making there. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just come back on, 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 on uh, one thing about this en engineering? I mean, I do think you get the, ultimately the best buildings when you've got an engineer and an architect working in, in harmony. And I, I think I've almost proved this at um, the last uh, year's European Structural Steel Conference because I thought it was sort of done fairly lightheartedly. But I, I, I asked four structural engineers to come up with a scheme without having an architect working with them at all for doing the same site as we've done the home base building, uh, 45,000 square feet with a clear span. Um, and uh, in theory, they had no help from an architect. It was an engineering solution. Now, the thing that, well, one of the things that fascinated me most that they were all considerably more expensive than our solution. The, the cheapest one was 20% more, and the, the most expensive one was double the cost of our structure. Which I thought was very interesting because if you, you might think that if you left an engineer on his own, he would come up with a really economical but maybe <coughs> solution. Um, but that wasn't the case. And I, um, I mean, you can look up because it's in published paper, but I don't think any of the solutions, with the possible exception of Marx, who, who, uh, what, um, um, <laughs> which, which, which actually was the one that was only 20% more, was there. Uh, that was because the contractor didn't think he could build it. The weight was too low. Um, but, 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 I mean, the, the interesting point was that, that uh, is, I think, that comes out of it, is that, that uh, it's when you get the two working together sort of harmoniously that you get the best solution, I think, and not, and not either one in isolation. But, of course, it might have something to do with the way in which, the, the way in which skills have been divided up, uh, in which people, architects do sort of concentrate all on the these articulations and engineering concentrates on, on calculation, but but doesn't have to be that way. But no, I mean, no, no, there, no, is, there no. is a focus on that. Isn't there, there is a focus. It shows, it shows that shows that architects not. are better than architecture than no, engineers. No, no. 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 Well, the calculations come after. I, yes, I'm not talking about I'm, calculations. I'm, in, in the, um, okay. Well, I was an absolute thrall. I know no engineer come up. Come up. <laughs> I'll arrest, I'll arrest hey, you. David, you've been trying. I just wanted to say right before Nico has said that there seems to be an impurity. I've heard three or four people talk about pure structure. I mean, what is a pure structure? Is what I'd like to ask. It seems to me to be something that we refer to as an extra skill. And if there's an extra skill, there must be engineers. It's an extra pure structure. I can't at the minute imagine that an architect would talk about a pure architecture. And I'd just like some clarification of this notion of pure structure that does not depend upon the relationship between pure and applied mathematics. I think yeah. Anyone I think like to respond yes, to the pure? I think an engineer would think of a pure structure as one that, for its form, is the most economical in whatever category 
what criteria are you guided by? Be it, be it amount of material used, be it construction cost, you can maximise it or minimise it for various things. But there are inherently better shapes for doing certain jobs than others. If somebody else is asking what's an engineer's ideal shape or ideal building. There are shapes which are better than others in engineering terms. They use less material just because of their natural shape. And that perhaps is what an engineer thinks of as a pure structure or an elegant structure, I think. Would you accept that? Comment? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I don't think there is such a thing as a pure structure. principles were at that time very much the boundaries of knowledge. They were spanning longer than they had before and therefore they had to do it more or less in the way they did. I don't think in structure this applies. You have infinite solutions almost. Uh, even when you mix a uh, 42 meter span, that's no big deal in terms of uh, what could be done. And uh, therefore it is surely then a question of synthesizing all the options uh, so that at the end it looks as though it is actually the only possible solution. <laughs> and it's interesting yeah, that the seventh bridge is the one which needs a strengthening, whereas the fourth bridge is the one which remains. Um, yeah. Yeah. Bridge so, so I think we get well, a long yeah. argument here, and I think we ought to keep off the back of that. Right. We shouldn't, um, James. <laughs> the seventh no, bridge was built before the Because, no, because, no, because no. the whole point is that well, you the, were actually the suggesting there was a separation right. between uh, a visual <laughs> formalization of what was seen and an engineering formalization, you were actually suggesting that the eye wasn't much of a feeder to the intellect. And it was a terrible suggestion that you made. And back to the business of what I was trying to say. The, the, the oh. seven bridge is not economic if in fact, as in fact it is. It is the one bridge in this country that is closed most often because of high winds, because it cannot carry the the trucks across it that it was designed for because no, no, they get no, blown no, 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 out. No, no, the Humber Bridge does. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is true. Well, it is the, it is the most often closed bridge. That's, that's true. And that is function that's true, of the bridge. It, so the, the function is, of the bridge is to carry the trucks. It's not a function of the bridge. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, it is. Otherwise, they wouldn't, otherwise, we wouldn't have paid for it. That's <laughs> what the bridge, we could have had a tunnel. <laughs> no, no, use, no use saying, and now we'll look at it. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, but it isn't intellectually pure because it's it, what the trouble with it. And this is what, what oh, actually what Tony Flint um, said, who was doing the, the doing the strengthening. He said, actually, it is the most amazingly economical structure. It was designed for the criteria that were set down by the Department of Transport, and so tight to this that when they actually decided that these criteria were wrong. Um, and that, that in actual practice, the vehicles bunched up and things, which was not allowed for in the design, in the ministries, <coughs> in their, their rules, um, then it didn't work, because it actually didn't have a margin. It had no margin in any direction. I think I'm right in this. Um, oh, absolutely right, and, um, But it, So in that case, it was possibly not an ideal bridge. It was incredibly cheap. Um, but always but had, it isn't cheap if it's only open 275 no. days of the year. And if engineers <laughs> don't question the criteria of their clients, ah, who yeah. happen to live in the Ministry of Transport, who happen to be spending our money, who happen to be yeah. equating it against to putting a tunnel underneath, and, and, and do not say, who put a criteria through, who the engineers do not question that the fact that traffic might bunch up, might be blown over, and that bridge will only be open yeah. 275 days of the year, then it is not a well-designed bridge. And it's no use sort of saying, oh, well, visually it looks nicer than the Humber Bridge. Um, you know, and, 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 and I think just, so to actually assume the brain doesn't contribute to the intellect is terrifying. What's it? Can I? What's it? Uh, well, yeah, the is, is, uh, uh, this is also uh, a profound uh, discontinuation. Uh, 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 uh,
The chairman, please, please. I, I, I must uh, try and cool down this, this, this Ruskinian intervention here. No, no, no. Right. Um, Very simply, Cedric is saying that the engineers should question the architects much more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the engineers should instead. In big the the please. Can I, this, can I go one farther no. and say, say that, that, the, that the engineers and the architects should have questioned the need for that track hard up against the edge at Waterloo? Because I think this is uncertain. And they, the St Pancras Arch was made because they wanted to move the tracks around. They never moved the tracks around since. So, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it was a marvellous advertisement for the Midland Railway. I think in actual practice, the Waterloo one probably is a marvellous advertisement for British Rail. And in that case, it, it, it pays for itself. But I think, actually, though, though you could equally say, compared with the Seven Bridge, that was it absolutely essential to have one of the tracks right up at the edge I find it you know, yeah. difficult to believe that. James is there already. already. If you want me to answer that, I will. And yes. The fact is that um, it isn't essential because um, really if they went the whole hog, they would, well, they would buy about half a mile's worth of buildings all the way along the track and give it a bit more room. It would be really nice. It would probably only cost about four or five hundred million pounds. And it would really make the station look a lot better. But, I mean, the fact is, life's not like that. Is it? Well, it wasn't like that on the Seven Bridges, all I have to say. Right. <laughs> well, we, we, <coughs> we did hear last, last week uh, that um, St. Marvin Station was one of the great achievements of the 19th century, economically speaking. It's the only one that we don't notice, but it was one of them, according to Robert here. But, uh, can Mark, could you, can I ask you, we've got to move, get moving on this. Right. There's, there's lots... Lots more moving pretty well, fast, fast anyway. anyway. <laughs> 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 That's the way you want to get to. Of course. Of course. I'm with. Uh, I'm fortunate in that I went to the uh, Festival of Britain, but I'm, as I'm old enough to have been there, but also young enough to have talked more about it. So I'll take us back a little bit further the Festival of Britain, and uh, I thought I'd show this little um, 1870s building, in, which is a little precursor, really, to Bush House. Um, it's a bridge over a river in Paris, and it's a chocolate factory inside, and one of the first, um, I think, steel frame buildings, or iron frame buildings that was ever built. But um, it's not so far away from the Pompidou Centre, and one could only criticise the expression of the structure here, really, for the fact that... Um, they have little um, braces um, around the, um, the crossover points of the diagonals. But this structure is not a brick building, it's just brick clad. A little bit later on you find people like Frank Lloyd Wright um, subtly expressing structure. Um, if you look carefully at this slide, I'm not sure if we can focus on that, but you'll see that there's a tie ring around the inside of this roof. And that tie ring is in fact the uh, tension ring to the thrusting, uh, thrusting forces from the roof. It's not been hidden around the, uh, the perimeter, but brought in on little chains. And furthermore, the uh, balcony you see underneath this roof is actually hung down on chains from the roof. There's a little uh, problem in my mind about the size of the chains holding the balcony <laughs> and the size of the chain tying the roof. Uh, there's a problem there, but never mind. But you'll see here, you know, people have always been expressing structure and finding problems with it. If you look at the problem that Frank Lloyd Wright found in the middle here, uh, when he brought all these members together, um, his resolution next time round was to do it a little bit more differently. And there you have a, a real case of structural expressionism, because here you have a case where the problem has been solved. I mean, that's the structural engineer's problem, but also the architect's one. But trying to solve the detail of bringing all these necessary members together in the middle um, he's resolved it nicely, as far as the architect's concerned, but this sort of solution with a hole in the middle is, a, is one of the biggest headaches an engineer could ever suffer, because what you get is enormous torsions going around this ring, and in this case this ring isn't, um, isn't a pure ring. Um, you have an enormous torsion which has to be taken out, unless of course these arms are Kentley for now. I'm, uh, I'm not privileged to know that, but I, I suspect it literally is. Um, 
as we have at the railway station, a three-pin, uh, uh, I wouldn't say arch, I would say a portable frame. <laughs> <laughs> To move on, I mean, I don't think this is necessarily structural express, expressionism as some people would like to talk about it. It's more as necessity to solve a problem and do it in a sort of graceful manner um, with a certain economy without necessarily reverting to the form of the buildings which are more normal in the situation in um, Australia, such as these sort of um, alpine huts built, built on the same street. Uh, the truth is here you have a ravine, it's 45 degrees slope minimum, and one wanted to build a building which could be built on that site, which the um, client bought because it was considered uh, a place which couldn't be built on. Um, he built that house for £60,000, having sold his little uh, Georgian terrace in, um, in Bloomsbury. I was from Bloomsbury, it was down in Stockwell, um, it wasn't that good. But, uh, you know, this is the sort of thing you can do. The site cost him £12,000. Uh, it's a shame we wouldn't be able to be allowed, wouldn't be allowed to build like this over here. But I mean, the other thing about this is, to be honest, that from the structural engineer's point of view, the case here wasn't a case of sitting down with an architect and dreaming up a solution. It was a case of an architect coming with a, a, a finished painting which he submitted to the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, <laughs> uh, and that painting was not is not dissimilar to what we see here. Um, and I say that with with, with um, with pride, because as an engineer, all we did was make the idea work um, and just work on it that little bit uh, to make it possible. Um, we'd split the, uh, the way it was meant to be on this drawing, there's one member up the centre of the frame. Uh, we didn't want to make one very long ladder, we didn't want to bolt it together there in a clumsy manner, so we just opened it up and made two members. I mean, uh, thinking about detail, which is really what that last building was about <coughs> from an engineering point of view. You can take um, this detail, which is from the Hadassage building in, in, um, with, with John Pringle and Michael Hopkins. And, and in a sense, this is a case of trying to do, um, with, let's say, grace and elegance, um, a very simple job, which is build a round building on an old gasometer site, uh, but unfortunately, again, with a hole in the middle. Um, so we could have built the roof of the Albert Hall for the time we spent analysing the structure. Um, I say that. Again, it was, was about maybe 15% of the time we spent on designing the building, uh, doing the sums, as, as people put it. Um, it's a necessary task and a very informative one. But here you have a detail which is really, in some respects, very crude, but part of a building which is actually very, very elegant. <coughs> I'm showing this one of, of a building with Benson and Forsyth, not because it's actually about structure at all, uh, although it could be plain. I mean, it, it's, it's impossible to really say whether it's structural expressionism. I mean, it's a column, it's a beam. The column's missing the retaining wall because, I mean, we don't want to get confused with the, with the loading up the top of the, um, the retaining wall. Um, the other side of the structure sits on a granite boulder, which is part of a, um, of a glacial hill in this Yorkshire, Yorkshire side. Uh, it's, it's just necessity. It's done well. And uh, this is a complimentary one to Frank's slide. Same architects as did the um, Doncaster job, but as Frank wanted to walk away from his Doncaster job, I'm quite proud to be part of this one. It's, it's maybe overdone. I'm not sure. We could have built a swimming pool um, without an external steel structure. I mean, it's a pain painting steel work when it's inside a swimming pool. Um, and there was probably no need to mix timber and steel up. But um, having said all that, it's, it's a nice solution and it solves a whole series of problems to do with spectators being on one side of the pool, and there being a very formal park landscape on the other side of the pool, which meant that you wanted a very low building on one side, and a high space on the other side. So you've got a, a logic to making a, making a form, which eventually sort of gives you a shape. And the shape's not necessarily the easiest to build. Um, it's not necessarily the easiest solution, but it's actually, at the end of the day, no more complicated than doing it in a, complicated, in a, in a simple manner. And I, I, I sort of drop down to detail again because if you want to talk about engineering, you, you can't really talk about these drawings or sections of buildings and say that's engineering because, I mean, where we spend our time when we're working as engineers is, is more in the detail than in the, in the concept. 
Um, you know, it's quite easy to have a hundred conceptual ideas for a building very quickly. We, can be, we probably have at least ten good ideas for everything you, everything you do. Um, nine get to start get discarded, and one gets developed and developed and developed, and you end up building it. Sometimes it's on peril, because you find out all sorts of things about it as you go on. I mean, I could go back to the working one and point out the bits I had to add in to make the first idea work. But, but you know, at the end of the day, you've got to actually see it right way through down to the final nut and bolt. And there's an elegance in doing that, and it's not a case of us sort of having ideas and passing them down the line to an architect who details it all up. It's a sort of case of making something work, and not allowing the architecture to compromise the engineering, nor allowing the engineering really to compromise the architecture. And I would think structural expressionism, if you want to put it like that, exists everywhere that people work properly together. And I'm going to show a final slide which we can all go back and look at, because if there's any good example of structural expressionism, there's this building. Now, architecturally, it's a disaster at a road level, and that's being put right. But the fact is that this is a, is a structural building. Um, but it, it's also a very constructional building. Uh, it's a load-bearing concrete facade, literally bolted together on site, um, supporting what is quite a fine office space, if anybody's been inside and looked at it, and particularly if you think about having a view too. But um, I mean, it suffered, um, unfortunately, to be sort of considered um, not appropriate, well, inappropriate in terms of architecture. I, I would beg to suggest that if you really want structural expressionism, um, it exists, you know, you, you can find it anywhere. Um, particularly, probably in the, in the 60s, just as much as it did in the 30s and just as much as it did in the 1870s. Right, thank you very much. <laughs> Right, well, you pass a chair. People leave it. Is David Dunster somewhere? Yeah. Uh, is he? Would you be. Would you. Would, would you like to. and so on, 
in some of those beautiful diaphanous sculptures. If I look at minimalization, it can be of that sort, or it can be of the sort of club hopping sort, which makes structures which are, by all criteria of habitation, uninhabitable, by token of subduing. But the main point I'd like to make, and this is, I think, my serious point, is that in considering structural representation, structural expression, we have forgotten the fact, perhaps, or maybe have omitted the fact, that a certain sense of priority has been fundamentally reversed. Now, if I wanted to set up a house, I would get first a telephone or a telex or whatever, however elaborate I was, and build a carapace around it when I had enough money to do so. Previously, I would build a carapace, a hut, and I would bring in the telephone. Uh, Cedric would bear up by philosophy, I'm sure, on this, because we yeah. cooperated in a recent project, but not terribly successful, but that was probably <laughs> because uh, we were first time oh, right. and he did the information and I did the architecture. The, uh, and we didn't uh, consult enough on the engineering. The, uh, it's interesting that if you try to build an information environment in which we live now, I am an information engineer. I'm also, as a matter of fact, a mining engineer. But I'm an architect of knowledge. And herein is habitation. Herein does the beauty lie. Herein does the intellect, not the intelligence, the intellect, reside. That is a profession, I do believe. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, David, you, you would, you, your, your slide's ready. Yep. I, I didn't want to talk about, I mean, I find the whole idea of structural expressionism terribly dull. <laughs> um, it belongs to a period of dead architecture for me, uh, when people were looking for some notion of truth vouchsafed by somebody else. And if I think about the notion of expressionism, I would say that, it, which is the thing that would interest me most, uh, it would occur in the 20s. This is Alfred Barr's cow of art, of art and architecture. You'll see expressionism is in there someplace, on the left-hand side middle. And the kind of expressionism, which I find interesting, which I never find in structural expressionism, is I don't know if the lights could go down a bit. This is an authentic <coughs> painting called Homage to Beauty. That's great. Um, it's something to do with the city. Uh, something to do with loving and hating it and finding it hard. This is Dix's very ironic object. And when I look at sort of buildings that are produced at the time of uh, the Dix painting, like this Bruno Tant scheme in East Berlin, you can see that the building I don't really think it expresses any structure, but it's certainly modelled on the notion of Berlin. It has in the middle a wide boulevard, and then, which you see here, off that, a narrow street scaled to the normal uh, street scale in the centre of Berlin, and in between that are allotments. Um, also something I find quite interesting. The building doesn't express itself. It does say something about the city. I think what is disgusting about the architecture of new brutalism and structural expressionism has always been that it wants to produce an individual monument. It's basically greenfield site architecture has very little to do with the city. And I find this very depressing. Having said that, I think that what's happening to Nick Grimshaw's scheme of Waterloo is absolutely disgusting but does indicate, in the sense of what British Royal want to put on top of it, but does indicate the absolute problem of a structurally conceived scheme. 
because now there's going to be this awful office building on the top of it, which comes right through, which means that there's no reason anymore for this big span because of the big columns of the office, I assume. And I'd like, while I deprecate structural expressionism, and I, but I love engineering, I'd like to suggest that now we start a petition in defense of mixed building, because what British Rail is suggesting is just gross and has nothing to do with the city. Thanks. <laughs> okay, now, um, would, would John like yeah. to mm. join in on the stage? Right. I've got some slides in there. Okay. John, John Pringle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. John Pringle. <laughs> Actually, I think um, structural expression seems to imply that um, there's a fantastic ready-made menu of structural um, ingredients that you can feed into your, your building. But in fact, we find this rather the reverse. It's, uh, we spend more time trying to, trying to get them out, because especially with our... Yes, especially with our buildings, where we are um, have a very um, slim buildings where everything is taken back to the, the bones. The, one can't afford to have any structure which is uh, uh, in inconvenient places. Um, I think the thing that's most important to us is actually the software aspect of structure. It's the way of, of looking at buildings to really achieve what you want to do and um, uh, to try and do what, what looks obvious and to then justify it um, later. It provides the, the, the software that enables the buildings to happen. And really structural engineering is only one aspect of it. Um, in our buildings I think we'd like to see that structure is obviously a very important <coughs> ingredient. But there's also the thermal engineering and um, the constraints of the site. And there's a, really a whole stew of things that you put all the ingredients in and you let them cook during the design process and they sort of come out with some ingredients that have been sort of boiled away over the process of the project, and there's just a hint of the flavor of them left, but some of them remain as a very strong, um, a very strong influence at the end. And structure is obviously going to be one of those things that uh, r remains throughout the project. Um, in fact, if we take Lord's Cricket Ground, which is, uh, uh, has some fairly um, uh, expressive bits of structure above, apparently, I, to me, the most wonderful bit of engineering is, in fact, right under the existing terrace, which, um, if we can have the next slide, there's, um, when the, over the, that roadway, there's a, a lot of concrete slabs, which were quite patently standing up for a um, hundred years, and all the filler joists had rusted through, and really there's just a load of clinker, which was uh, standing up in space, and it was quite obvious it was working, but it was getting the engineers to look at it in a way that could justify that it would actually work. And what we found in the end was that um, you know, whilst if you're building it as a new structure, you would do it as a reinforced concrete slab, by analysing it as a, as a flat arch, suddenly the whole thing can work, whereas it was a, it was a dangerous structure um, just ten minutes before. And the, the, this was something that intrigued us. Then, um, when we came to do the brick arches, which was really trying to recreate the building as it had... Um, uh, you know, re refurbish the building in a way that it um, should always have been built. We suddenly realized that, that there was quite a magic in what is really a pile of rubble, but if you put it in the, in the right geometry, it, um, it suddenly becomes a, a, a coherent structure. And those brick arches there are all solid brick through and through. There's no concrete in them. And it's uh, built as, you know, what you see is doing the job, is actually holding, holding the building up. Um, I think if we can go on to the next slide. The, th this is a building where I worked with uh, uh, Tony Hunt and Mark Whitby when Mark, Mark was at Tony's. And to me, this is something, again, trying to get something which is clear, which is legible, because I, I think engineers' first responses aren't always to provide legible structures. In this case, we, um, we like the idea of the three-pin portal frame. This is the Patera building, which is a standard industrial unit. 
And we put the structure inside because it provided one hour fire resistance, the, the structure outside, so that it, the cladding would provide one hour fire resistance to the structure. But then the, when you, and the three, three pin portal frame is a very beautiful concept, but when you start to look at it in, in more detail, all the problems of wind uplift mean that all the load reversals result in a lot of bracing on the outside of the structure. And we, we um, really re rejected the first responses from the engineers, and th this really led to another way of looking at the structure, whereby you could get the beautiful three-pin frame to work, and the key in it was the tie in the, in the middle, which um, would make the structure perform as a two-pin frame in uplift, <coughs> as opposed to a three-pin frame under, oh. under um, live snow loads. And uh, suddenly we could remove all that ugly bracing and all the sort of uh, overstructure on, overstructuring on the outside of the building. And th this was just the, the software was the thing that released the, the, the different way of looking at the building that um, <coughs> suddenly makes it all work, whereas it didn't work ten minutes before. And uh, th this was, a, in, in the end, ended up as a, you know, really quite a brilliant invention which uh, uh, Mark patented. If we can take the next slide. Again, this is the David Mellor factory, which uh, Mark referred to earlier. Mark was the engineer on, on this job. And um, th there was a, another nice detail, in fact, the same detail that Mark referred to earlier. If we can go on to the next slide, which is the, um, the, the bearing detail. And the interesting incident here was that the district surveyor came back and um, said that that's, that's overstressed. It's, um, we had, had it designed as a, a leaf spring, whereby... You, it wouldn't impose thrust into the perimeter wall, but would, um, the, the wind loads could be taken out in the plane, in the direction of, of the wall itself. And the district surveyor came up quite rightly saying that the, this, was, um, this was overstressed, and M Mark's um, response was to demonstrate that actually if it failed or you know, became overstressed and deflected too much, the structure would work better. And uh, the district surveyor in, in, in the end um, accepted that. You but, take a max saw to it and just saw it, uh, saw it through slightly. And they to reduce the stresses. So, you know, again, this is, this is really engineering where it isn't so much the hardware that's there. It's a, you, you've got to have the way of looking at it and the program that makes the obvious concept work, the thing that we all knew worked from, from the beginning. But it takes a lot more work, I have to say. But it, it's, um, it's, uh, in the end, you come up with something that's legible. And I, I must say that engineers' first responses, the responses uh, generally rather illegible structures. You know, they, they work, they solve the problem. And you can design a three-pin portal frame which has no pins in it at all. You can analyze it as a three-pin frame and it, it, it'll work as one, but it won't look like one. And the, really there's no, no clarity in the, in the way the, that it works. We're going to go on to the next slide. Um, again, going back to Lords, th this illustrates a preoccupation with the materials where you have the materials in the base which is a load of rubble which is in compression and only works because of the geometry working up to the top where there's a membrane roof which is just a, a floppy bit of canvas which is nothing unless you hold it in tension under a very specific geometry and again th that's um, something that uh, I think we, we enjoy is the fact that the materials um, can take on a completely different character if you apply a geometry or a, or a way of analyzing them. Taking the, um, the plate girder zone, which is the, um, in the, just below the roof, that, in, the, in that case, the key to that was fire engineering. Um, and the, you know, the, this is really a tribute to Margaret Law of our Arabian partners, who, and a lot of our buildings, including the Patera building, really owe um, the, uh, their clarity to the fact that you can get rid of all the fire protection you just look at it a different way, you analyze what the flame temperatures would be coming out of it, you can um, uh, analyze what the stresses are, and then you can show that what is a structure that you know works in the first place and is a very clear statement will, will actually work, but it takes a lot more of the software to, to, to do that. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Um, again, the Schlumberger building is really just another illustration of the, the, fa the fabric, which um, is... A, is um, a non-structural material, except if you hold it under, under a very specific geometry. And this, the structure really there is generated by trying to build an impossible diagram. We had a diagram where you had small cellular spaces on either side and a very big open uh, interior landscape space in the, in the middle. And the, the solution 
isn't in the abstract. One wouldn't build something, start off with something like that as a pure structure, but it's a response to all the requirements of the site. You, you've, got, you know, you've got your diagram that you have to build because it works, and you have to come up with a slightly funny structure, um, and you know, perhaps more expressive than, than one that uh, didn't have those constraints. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, again, we, something that interests us, this was a Bracken House um, competition scheme, which we, uh, we work with Mark again as the engineer, where we were trying to take the exterior architecture inside, and that, that, that was the taking those lords' flat arches in the old slab. We um, created jack arches inside, which are basically um, a, a structure, a flat structure with... Um, uh, with materials that wouldn't be load-bearing unless they were in that, that format. And that links through to the structure on the outside. On to the next slide. And this is the actual Bracken House facade, which uh, was modified. And the, when we had to retain the building, you get another influence, which is the fact that you have to retain an old building, you've got materials, and you know, there's the whole conservation um, problems to, to address. And really, the materials here generated the structural form. The, the facade is load bearing gunmetal uh, on load-bearing stone. And th this, in, in fact, it probably isn't a million miles away from center point in terms of having the, the load-bearing load -bearing facade. But you, it's some, something where each material has a conviction because it is part of an overall structural system, which also extends inside the building. And on to the last slide. And that this was a competition, in fact, the Peters Hill competition, where we were taking the services into the facade, and the structure was bent by the fact that we had these snorkels which took the fresh air for 100% fresh air cooling scheme right down to the basement plant rooms because we were constrained by St Paul's Heights. And this created a, a structure which was also part of your environmental control system. And uh, so there's no such thing really as a pure structure. It's all um, influenced by it, the structure is one element, but you have to read all the other factors that are going on at the same time. So that's all. I think. All right, thank you very much. Ron, do you have any slides? Ron? No. No, you don't. But, uh, okay. <coughs> right. Um, is is, is there any price anywhere? Yeah. Do you have some slides? I Right. Cedric Price. Is that loud enough? I rather like, <coughs> I like that um, last composition, sort of Pringle pudding, <laughs> in, a, in a mixture. I like that. Um, the last, the very last film, it reminded me of the work done by James Stock, the architect, in uh, the 1860s in Cotton Mills. <coughs> Where in fact all the extract, rather than the input, all the extract of uh, um, cotton dust laden air was carried out through the vertical columns, vertical cast iron columns, which had a, a great effect on the on their diameter, but also increased their, their stiffness through the diameter being increased as such. And the, and the one before um, the, the gun metal and, and uh, inevitable pink stone uh, was an interesting example of, of really paying attention to that overrated architect Albert Richardson's uh, original building in, in those bay windows, you know, the faceted windows from the pink thing. So that was, that was dressing the pudding, whereas the last one was mixing it. And, and I thought the Lord's one was an interesting example of, of what the point we were trying to make is that you can't actually, in the terms of tonight's conference, actually define out individual elements and say, add them together, and then they, mm -hmm. they tell the whole story. Um, I just feel that uh, it's been very nostalgic this evening. 
And uh, I hope that both of us have a little bit of investment in the future. I thought I'd make the following points. Is that I believe that um, engineers who are consulted by architects, such as those here tonight, and they were speaking about, uh, should I, I personally think engineers should have social intention, full stop. I also think that the direction of such intention should be assessed by the architect, not, not tailored by the engineer. And that's what makes you choose an engineer or reject one, and it may be what makes an engineer choose an architect or reject one. And a good example uh, of what I mean is uh, Peter Duncan. He made no secret of his, his social intentions and his appetites. I believe such engineers should have hunches and they should be prepared to back them. I believe such engineers should delight in their own capacity to change their mind. I think at the moment there's a danger that the dependence engineers take on um, various forms of computerization reduces their own capacity to change their minds drastically as opposed to change their minds on a piece of paper. And there's a danger, um, I don't think any architect wants, uh, well let's put it this way, I think most architects would like to work with an engineer who uh, is um, prepared to uh, change the menu of a meal rather than become a bespoke tailor, um, which is a difference of when the alterations are made, when the decision is made. I've got a feeling that there is a danger at the moment that engineers are, are being driven into ingenuity rather than rethink. The, uh, I'm encouraged if such engineers still hold, uh, and this comes back to Gordon's point, still hold interest in, it also comes back to Stephen Deet's point, that they hold interest in some of these items. Now this is a very personal statement, and I will keep you in ten minutes, I think. Well, I'm, not speaking. I'm interested in engineers who are concerned, not necessarily finish up with it, but are concerned in structures of least weight. I'm interested. In it. I'm interested in their concern about lifting and moving, whether it's in assembly or disassembly. I'm interested in their concern about shortage. Here I think one to quote uh, Samueli. Now whether it was imposed on him through the uh, fact that at the end of the war and during the war almost all materials, but particularly steel, were rationed. I'm interested in, in calculation where I, where I break through and all this chat that's going on about, and I think, Chris, we should take this up about uh, Hans Stanton, which certainly had nothing to do with concrete. Uh, remember how the portal frames were sprung apart by... I, oh, someone, <laughs> someone died, or is that ten minutes? <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, you know it's, I mean? it's a signal. It, right? <laughs> and I'm also interested at the same time the... Maison Jal and then the uh, not 
long after the Frank UV exercise and calculated load bearing brickwork, all of it three stories high, never mind the Manadnock building a hundred years earlier, going up to 70. Um, I'm also interested in visible structures, which takes up Frickle's point, um, in so much as he, you know, when you say pretty useless material unless you put it under tension, Schoenberg. Well, actually, the same sort of fabric is also a very good structural fabric if you introduce an absolutely invincible uh, key structural element, which is air pressure, which uh, you can flavor, you can smell like violets, <laughs> and it still hold the building up. <coughs> I'm also interested in uh, the uh, limitations which is why I, I had a go at, uh, I say I was feeling rather like Oldham, Oldham City then, having a go at uh, <coughs> our distinguished <laughs> Mr. Southern, Professor Southern. But I do think that, I, uh, that something like the Humber Bridge has been given far too much, uh, far too little attention, and the Seven Bridge has been given far too much. Um, I, I, I do not understand that. Engineers seem to like the Seven Bridge, and in a way, not really want to know too much about the Humber Bridge, which I find far more interesting. I'm also interested in the, in the uh, other quality of expediency at the time, which I would suggest is what the Fourth Railway Bridge was about. And very interesting too. And it comes on to a point which I would like to take up in discussion, is the whole misapprehension of the value of the tubular structure by engineers when they're told it's architecture and not bridge. And I think the breakthrough here is actually, fun enough, within the uh, oil industry, the North Sea oil industry, who have advanced the whole technology of tubular structures, the jointing, the calculating of transference of stress, and in fact the value of tying what uh, architects would see as disparate uh, foundations, you know, as long as the ground's deep enough and we put it tight, we don't need to tie it at that level. The whole business of tubular structures, um, I think, is, has got something to do moving from expediency to the experimental. And the experimental and expediency, I think, was brought together, together with shortage in something which uh, is still there, the very first one, well, I think the first one is still crossing the Trent uh, River just by Barson. The second one is still at Christchurch, as I saw yesterday, on the Bailey Bridge, which, I, again, I think is an absolute classic. And it, it's the trial Bailey Bridge is still there at, at Christchurch in Hampshire. Um, the uh, construction time and, and the whole business of, of uh, <coughs> manufacturing time which was absolutely critical, something like Bailey Bridge, um, is, is forgotten in relation to something like the Humber Bridge, and certainly, to a certain extent, is hidden uh, by architects into other times and timings, which I think is a great pity. And I think it's also an element that should be introduced by architects, uh, by engineers to architects. I think engineers have a responsibility <coughs> to, to remind architects about the efficacy of accurate timing in both design, construction, uh, useful lifespan, and demolition. I do not think that engineers at the present involved with architecture have many of these interests in heart, and therefore I think it's a rather sad period that it's the start of the night is, but all sorts of things can happen there. They meet in testing. <laughs> <laughs> How about it, Lee? You, 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 you've them. only got a couple more minutes. Yes, I've right. got two minutes for the slides. Yes. <laughs> um, I would like, lastly, to say that two things, three things I enjoy being involved with most in relation to engineers. One is the Medway crossing. Two is a 75-meter uh, mobile gantry, which is both parallel 
and radial in movement. And third is an absolutely nutty discussion I had both at, at Poole and in Bournemouth over the last two days with these people doing vertical, rigid uh, sails for boat propulsion. Now I will have the slides, give me a minute and a half to remind what I've just told you. Right? <coughs> Lifting. The assumptions as to what you lift, the height you lift it, and for how long it lifts. The only point about one on the right is that th two cranes were used to build a, a third crane, which was high enough to put mar uh, things on the post office tower. And it was higher than the three. Next. And it was on rubber tires. Um, don't forget what's underground, and don't forget what we're putting underground, or under sea, and its size. Next. <laughs> mobility. Uh, the object of mobility is less important than the intention. On the left, he liked the house, didn't like the view. <laughs> On the right, 1908, a mobile Zeppelin tent, all wood and canvas, and it could move almost as fast as the <coughs> Zeppelin itself. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Uh -huh. uh, uh, building and demolition. Remember the, 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 the cost of removing the waste. Quarry Hill. Photos by sea price. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Next. Uh, Urgency. Don't let's <laughs> always wait for the disaster. Let's plan it. <laughs> these I might add, none of these slides are criticisms of architects, they're all criticisms of engineers <laughs> who don't really seem to remind us about these <laughs> Next. Well, this is for Roy, the appropriateness of design. <laughs> of sighting and for how long. Uh, that's a floating island on the right, and that's a floating traveling family on the left. Next. Packaging. It's worth knowing how much the eventual product requires in its packaging, whether it's a chip or a, or a set of, of goods for a quite small Midwestern house. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Engineers, please <coughs> take all of them. Um, uh, c c can I ask whether anybody has, other people have got slides in the projector that, that, that I don't know about? Has anybody else got slides here? I've got a couple of days. Ah. Mike, would, would you... Uh, cause <laughs> I'll talk briefly less time than Cedric. I'm going to face the wall to see what's going on. I didn't take long. I took ten minutes. <laughs> Watch it. Okay. Well, really just a series of questions and, and things I like. 1509 to 1515, James Wire, John Wire, <coughs> uh, the fan vaulted roof at King's College, Cambridge. Why did he do it? I think he did it because it would be beautiful. And I think he did it because it performed the task that he set out to achieve. Next. 1851, Decimus Burton. Why did he do it? I think he did it because it was beautiful. And I think it set out and achieved the task that he intended. Next. The most important house built in the 1960s in the world 
Steve Bear's house, which is the precursor of the second industrial revolution. This was a steam radio valve version. We're talking, of course, about the electronic revolution. And this was the, the manual Victorian way of trying to attack the problem that we're now really trying to grapple with. Why did he do it? Because he was fascinated by the structural system. He was an engineer that the house is built from, the zone system. And he did it because it was beautiful. And he did it because he was concerned about its performance, as did John Wyatt and Decimus Burton. So I, I would offer the notion of performance as a judgment of structural quality. Next. Discontinuity here, of course. <coughs> Lloyd's, our own building. Why did we do it? Performance. Uh, not a direct link, I have to say. Not because it's beautiful, I have to say. But we're finding it increasingly difficult to separate a mid-blue custom-colored piece of steelwork, which we call structure, from something which we might call servicing, uh, from something we might call floor slab or space. In other words, we see them increasingly as integrated systems. We find it very difficult to see them as separate pieces. <coughs> So we're wrestling with the problem of integration all the time. Now here, the reason for, the, for Lloyd's is that plan. That plan is what generates everything else in the building. That is what Lloyd's is about, that plan. And it's about performance and growth and change over time. The ability to accept that certain parts of that structure would be expressed in different ways according to what they would be doing over the next 150 years or 10 years, depending on how long the building will last. We certainly didn't intend the coloured pieces to last a long time in their current form. In fact, somebody, I think, last night, in fact, uh, raised the issue of the problem of Lloyd's when it's listed, as I'm sure it will be in the end, uh, and what you do with all these changeable elements on the outside of a listed building. I think our solution is to list all the elements separately. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Just, again, an illustration of the performance. Uh, the middle slide on the right really illustrates the yellow, which is the main block of the building, which is the human housing element, and all the blue is just that which supports it. Next. Again, performance. Conflans saint honorine a skating rink, beautiful little structure. It's been around for a very, very long time by Kefalek. Um, a bat lives in a hole in the ground, and... When the sun comes out, the bat automatically rises, stretches its wings over the stadium area, and covers the ice to keep it out of the sun. And everybody carries on skating. And when the sun disappears, it disappears back into the ground again. Of course, to great cheers from the crowd as it happens. We get a word from, from Jenny Lowe, and maybe a word from Peter Salter, just towards the end, if, if, uh, if you would agree to that. So. <coughs> Uh, could I, first of all, perhaps uh, go to Robert, Robert Thorne, and ask yes. him if... I don't know whether you particularly want to address these issues, but it would be nice if maybe we could round some of these questions up. I'd just like, as the only historian um, in, the, in the front stalls, to pick up on a couple of things that people have said this evening and to reflect very briefly indeed on the, the character of this event. Um, first, I think, as a historian, I can't accept... Um, Mark Whitby's uh, proposal that structural expression has, or is always with us, nor can I really accept uh, Ron Heron's uh, proposition that everything's going on at the same time, because I think you called us all here.